Good day, everyone, and welcome to the BMC Connect Control M High Availability and Disaster Recovery Conference Call. Today's call is being recorded, and at this time, I would like to turn the conference over to Mr. Brian Looney. Please go ahead, sir. Thank you. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and for some, uh, even good evening. Welcome to today's call of Connect Control M. We're going to talk about high availability and disaster recovery. Um, there's a new term out in the industry, I believe you've heard it called application continuity, which and that's a little bit about how to get control in a usable state. Um, we're going to talk about some things here that uh, can help make your environment a little bit more reliable. Um, one of the first things that people think about when they start planning their, I guess you could say planning for disasters, they think about what they can do in their local data center. And these are where you see the high availability clusters uh, that I think we've all gotten familiar with. These are your um, Microsoft cluster, uh, Veritas cluster server, HACMP, uh, Red Hat cluster suite. Um, these are all kind of based off of a single resource which is shared between uh, multiple nodes. Um, this is where you um, basically have your shared database uh, or your database which is relying on the shared file system. Um, that's not a one system at a time. Um, Control M supports Microsoft clustering natively. Um, what we mean by that is when you actually go to install it, uh, it's going to pick up that Microsoft cluster is installed and ask you if you want to install the application into the cluster. Uh, at that point, you'll pick your appropriate resources and it'll actually go in and define itself and you have a little bit of work to do on the back end. Um, for the Unix-based uh, customers, we actually have written in the documentation as of six full um, what we call policy files that help you start and stop the application as well as a couple of different methods uh, to manage the suit within a cluster. Um, now granted these are solutions that are typically tied to a, a single data center because they require high bandwidth, um, low latency links between the servers. And when I say latency I'm talking about the amount of time it takes me, not so much how much data. Um, that comes into play when we start talking about um, disaster recovery. How do we handle when there's a, a problem with our site or if the site just drops off of the map? Um, this is where you normally hear the, the term disaster recovery used most. Most of our Unix customers uh, um, have different methodologies for this. They, they talk about application. They're replicating from um, one machine to another. Um, at this point, we don't recommend that for a control limb. There's a lot of factors that have to take into account that um, that aren't addressed yet, such as how do you handle um, operating system patches, um, operating system changes such as host name, IP address. Um, we're working on some future enhancements uh, where we're hoping to support this in the near future. One of the other things that people like to do is they like to back up the uh, live system and restore it elsewhere. Um, one of the problems you run into with this is the database itself typically cannot be backed up while it's running. And uh, as most of you have tried this before, you've uh, run into the situation of where you go to turn on the database and it's telling you there's a problem that it can't recover from. And you end up having to start over with the database and reload your data. There are a couple of ways that this is uh, handled. Uh, with the, it's usually vendor-specific solutions. Um, they have, one of the common things they'll do is they'll replicate the database so you're not caught in this position. And that's where you see things like, um, Microsoft SQL Server replication, um, Oracle standby server. So that's one of the, we'll say that those are hot solutions that actually require a piece of running hardware on the other end. Um, control and the server has something built into it called mirroring, which is very similar to, the, to these kind of uh, active, active database environments. Um, when you start talking about database replication, you have what's called synchronous and asynchronous type replications. Um, with the synchronous replication, the actual data is not committed on the primary until after it's uh, committed on the secondary. And this guarantees that the data is consistent in both locations. With the asynchronous, um, the transaction is committed locally and sent to the remote side for processing. Um, there is definitely a performance impact when you're talking synchronous. Um, with the asynchronous, not the performance impact, but you do have the possibility for some lost transactions, mainly because you're not relying, you're not waiting for that database to say the transaction is taking place. With the control room server mirroring solution, it actually writes to both databases. 
that this is only a partial solution. It actually does not do anything for enterprise manager, so that's something else you have to address. Um, as I said before, when you start talking about these types of database replications, latency is a very important factor. Um, due to the latency involved in writing to the synchronous, you need to look at if control room server mirroring for us, you know, um, does our current load in our network support that type of configuration? So let's get back to the what are some things that we can do now. Um, one of the things uh, that a lot of database vendors have is they have what's called an archive mode. Um, and to my knowledge, I think you have this in Oracle uh, Sybase. Um, when this is enabled, you actually have a backup and a set of transaction logs, which are transactions that have taken place since. Now, if you have that backup in those transaction logs, you can recover this database uh, back to that time. So there's a concept that Microsoft made popular called log shipping. Um, and what they did by that was you took the full backup you put the the, art, the transaction logs, or archive logs as they are, onto another file system, and then you ship those off to wherever your, um, your safe site is. One of the benefits of this is once you've turned on the system, if you save those files within um, that same machine when the admin does their full backup, you actually have a usable database now, because with the full backup and the uh, archive logs, you can actually restore this database back. Now, depending on how many of those backup sheets and archive logs is at a point in time restore. Um, not always applicable for when you're actually running a production system, but if you want to simulate an issue that happened or try to figure out what went wrong, um, you can look at this information. Uh, for our hands-on today, we're actually going to look at a Postgres system that's running um, Control Room Server uh, 7, and we're actually going to turn on the hot backup mode, which we're going to call archive mode, and um, we'll let you see how that works. So let me go ahead and get this set up. So you should see my two screens now. And in order to turn on the archive mode of Postgres, we actually need two directories. Uh, we need to make a directory for the archive logs, which we call DB archive. And we're going to make a directory for our backup, because remember, these two are a pair. We've actually built some things into the software to make this um, pretty easy to do. You can actually go to the CTM menu under the database menu, management. We can set the archive mode up. All right, and once this is done, it's actually going to require a restart of Postgres. Um, and we're not running control room server at the moment, just the database, so we'll go ahead and um, stop the database. And then we will restart it. And as I said before, it's important that you actually take a hot backup of the system, which is actually a full database backup, because you need that as well as the archive logs to restore the system. And it's going to, we actually went to the menu for uh, maintenance, and then we chose hot backup. It's going to ask us where we want to store that. And this is running a backup right now, which runs pretty quick. And the other show, we're going to come over here, and we're going to look and see the, the two directories we created. And if we go to the DB underscore archive, we're going to see uh, these archive logs. And if you notice, they're 16 meg in size. Now, whenever a backup's run, a dot .backup file is created. And these, uh, these files are actually sequenced. Um, and uh, hexadecimal, so it'll be F, and then we'll go back to five. So you can actually clean up the logs prior to the backup, so we can actually remove the D log um, and any ones that would be there before. We're going to go up here, we're going to open another window, use the second window. Okay. 
And this is actual backup. And it's pretty neat. It actually takes both a uh, snapshot of the database, um, and it also has the executables. And it gives you a couple of scripts to put those in place. Now, we have a solution out there, which has actually uh, been posted to the community now, as well as the, the white paper that talks about this concept. One of the things that the uh, KA does, um, use the new terminology of K instead of solution, you can tell I've been here for a while. Um, it actually talks about how you can run these in batch. And when you start looking at automating this, you may look at, well, I may want to take the full backup and the, the hot backup, which is the data that's in the DB backup, and the archive logs that are associated with it, and archive those. When I say archive, put them under tape, get them over to your DR site. Now remember, if you choose to replicate your backup and your archive logs in real time over to your DR site, you're actually going to be able to recover and, re and, and restore as accurate as the last replication. So you can actually just get by on reinstalling the application, putting these files back in place, and then doing a restore. One of the things to talk about, uh, if you look at the diagram in the back, there's a snapshot of the community page. And here you see the, or the uh, article about the Connect Control M. Uh, we've added on the bottom of it a link to uh, the new application continuity white paper that we've published. And it goes into these concepts. It um, also talks about um, these things with using your own supply databases when you're running your own Oracle, SQL Server, or Sybase. Um, we're going to monitor the phase for the next couple of weeks, and then periodically thereafter for any questions that come in um, after the day of session. And, we'll, and if you see somebody else put a question out there, feel free to answer. Jump in and um, let them know what you're doing. So I'll leave you a couple of uh, resources here. Um, like I said, keep an eye on the community page. Feel free to put any questions out there. At the same time, if you see somebody ask a question, you can answer it. Go ahead and jump in and uh, give an answer. Uh, we're going to be monitoring that for the next couple of weeks and then periodically thereafter. So um, we'll jump in there. Also, make sure to take a look at the application and continuity white paper. It's got a little bit more specifics about what to do once you get over there that's usable. Because just because Control M Server was actually able to get over to uh, to get over and get up and running doesn't mean the rest of the applications are. You may find that your PeopleSoft or SAP is a day or two behind. And what are you going to need to do scheduling wise to handle those? Um, there's also a knowledge article posted out there that gives you the specifics of calling all of this in uh, batch mode. And so you can actually script this and put a nice little pretty wrapper about it so you don't have to worry about it. And the link on here is going to take you directly to the communities page, which you've seen. At the same time, I know this is a very complex um, operation. And if you want to contact uh, your account rep, they can put you, they can put you in touch with any services or any um, they can get you additional resources to help you come up with a design that works for this. Important, 6.3 is retired at the end of this year. So uh, I hope everybody has already started. If you're on 6.3, start looking at getting on version 7 by the end of the year. And there's a big kickoff party, which I'm sure you've seen advertised everywhere next uh, next week for version 8. So uh, check that out um, and see how it fits into your timeline. So we have a couple of webinars coming up. Uh, November 14th, Basil is going to wow us with his LDAP knowledge. Uh, for those of you who opened the LDAP case, I'm sure you've spoken to Basil many times before, as well as self-service and a couple other little specialties he has. Uh, James Spindergrass is going to give us a run-through of AFT. And I'm looking forward to Richard Talbert and JCL Verify. Um, I'm a distributed guy, so I'm hoping to see what's behind the green screen that they put together here to make things easier for the MDS folks. Um, at the conclusion of today's uh, webinar, when you log out, you're going to get a survey. Please take the time to fill it out. And there's also a place to put in what you'd like to see discussed in future topics. Uh, we read those, we pay attention to those, and that helps us drive what's going to be in the next session that we have. Um, and following us on all the social media, we're on Twitter and Facebook. And again, thank you for attending today's session.